So we've got a great lineup <laughs> of speakers today. We've um, we felt the need to have this meeting because of the. Um, it was inspired by the government's um, so-called energy strategy, and um, we've been holding um, through our trade union group um, a lot of meetings, which some of you may have been at, which um, have been looking at the different topics um, relating to the recent climate jobs report. But this one's going to be a lot more overarching and trying to link together some of these um, different topics. Claire, Claire, you muted. We can't hear you, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, just saying, great to see people um, in, in, introducing themselves in the chat. And um, I'll say again for people who've just joined that, um, that this meeting is being recorded, but um, we're not live streaming it. The message you might have seen on your screen is about the streaming to the closed caption service, that subtitles, which you can access by probably clicking the more button at the bottom of your screen. So I think we've got probably Claire, you've muted again. I don't know what I'm not sure what that um, why that happens, but I will I will try not click any more buttons and stay on. Well, I will introduce our speakers that we've got today. Um, Suzanne, I expect many of you know so Suzanne Jeffrey. She is our chair at the Campaign Against Climate Change. We have um, Ruth from Ruth London from Fuel Poverty Action, who has been um, campaigning for long, long before the current cost of living crisis about the situation of people in fuel poverty around the country as a long-standing problem and not a new thing at all. Um, we have Wolfgang Kutler, who is the um, who is an architect and um, has experience in um, retrofitting homes to be low carbon, low energy, and is also was also a major contributor to the buildings chapter of our trade union group's climate job report, jobs report. Next, we have um, Tina Rothery, who um, and will need no introduction from many of you as an anti-fracking campaigner and co-founder of the anti-fracking Nanas, um, a fight that was one we hope for good, but we will see what the government comes up with. We have um, Gabrielle Davalos from uh, the campaign at Stop Cambo, and indeed not just the Cambo oil field, but in fact all new North Sea oil fields. And Katie Barron from Biofuel Watch, a, um, a campaign that the campaign against climate change have been um, working with for many years and is, um, I think, one of the, uh, the best campaigns that's seeing through greenwash um, I've come across, whether that be um, burning palm oil, burning, burning trees, all the things we don't want to be burning. So to introduce, it's just under, I checked, it's literally just under six months since Boris Johnson stood on the stage at COP26 and um, spoke eloquently, well, as eloquently as he can, of the need for urgent climate action. And since then, we've seen a simultaneous heat wave at both poles with temperatures recorded at the same time up to 30 degrees above 30 degrees c above normal in the arctic and, and above up to at some places above 40 degrees c above normal in the antarctic um, there's been heat what heat waves wildfires and floods um, ongoing um, drought and hunger crisis in the horn of africa there's currently wildfires in Siberia and a, a really abnormal early um, heat wave in India and Pakistan. Uh, since then, there have been two more IPCC reports published, 
which have warned them um, firstly of the terrible consequences and already and existing impacts of climate breakdown and the other that the time time is running out to act and to get off fossil fuels and also since cop 26 we've had the war in ukraine and rising gas prices rising energy prices which have um, exacerbated the cost of living crisis in this country the heads of the energy companies have warned that there could be 40 percent of people in this country in fuel poverty by this coming winter so we thought that this might finally push our government into decisive action on reducing our dependence on fossil fuels but when it finally arrived a few weeks ago their energy strategy turned out to be not really a strategy at all it didn't help with paying bills it didn't help with cutting energy de demand and it didn't help reduce our dependence on gas and, but what it did do was threaten to backtrack on our climate commitments by increasing North Sea oil drilling. And even um, just today, we've seen that the, a new um, coal mine in Cumbria is on the verge of approval by the government. There are so many different battles to, to fight on so many fronts, it could it almost seem overwhelming. But we think if we link these together and take inspiration um, with what campaigns are already doing, um, we can fight back. So to start off today, I want to introduce um, Suzanne, Chair of the Campaign Against Climate Change, to talk about work on climate jobs. Thanks, Claire. Uh, and can I just uh, welcome everyone to the meeting also? Can I ask Claire um, to put a spotlight perhaps on me for the recording and for, for speakers that come afterwards? um if that would be possible and perhaps also to make martin a co-host if that's doable so there's a few of us working on the tech um through the course of the meeting as well um it, thanks so much um for the introduction claire and thanks also for everybody who has um attended tonight i, I would guess that many of us are, are feeling uh, the same concern that Claire outlined at the start of the meeting, that we have a, a moment here where we need to respond um, and we need to respond uh, collectively, coherently um, and with as much en energy as possible to ensure that this moment is not one in which um, the opportunity to transition is missed and instead we have a push in, 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 in the opposite direction from a Tory government that's um, come very late to the day in terms of any kind of engagement with the climate crisis and clearly, as Claire said, is happy to move away from any commitments to tackle the climate crisis as quickly as they possibly can. In terms of this so-called energy strategy um, that the government have produced in the last uh, couple of weeks, I think from our position in terms of campaign against climate change, and I would guess uh, many people share the same position, it's an, a strategy which is neither going to tackle the so-called energy crisis, which I've seen Deepak uh, term a greed crisis, which I think probably uh, sums up the issue more than the energy crisis does. It's not going to tackle the cost of living crisis, and it certainly isn't going to tackle um, the climate crisis. It's a cobbled together strategy which plays to um, you know, the lobbying power of the uh, oil and gas industry. It plays to the lobbying power of some of um, uh, Johnson's backbenchers. And essentially, in many ways, it's a strategy designed to solve Johnson's crisis. Um, rather than the cost of living crisis or the energy crisis or the climate crisis. It's kind of designed to cherry pick, pick bits and bobs of things um, that Johnson thinks will save his skin and save his, save his, his career in many ways. So, as I say, you know, you've got the success of the lobbying of the fossil fuel industry um, and you've got a, a, you know, a sort of uh, plenty of sops to the um, backbenchers, and you've got an attempt to cynically exploit the war in Ukraine um, by presenting this, uh, using the war in Ukraine and presenting this energy strategy as somehow uh, able to tackle, uh, to, to, to sort of respond to that crisis, you know, a government that has 
you know, plenty of sops to, um, uh, to, 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 to Russian oligarchs up to this moment in time, uh, but essentially it is just uh, to play um, to an agenda that will, will hopefully, uh, uh, from Johnson's perspective, he keep his government in power. It's a cobbled together strategy and it does not do the things that need to be done most crucially. Claire mentioned, and I know other speakers will um, talk about this year, devastating um, impact that the uh, right raises and energy costs are gonna have uh, for people. Um, and this is combined with some of the cruelest things that any government could have done. This government has simultaneously failed to address the energy crisis in terms of the rise in energy costs, um, whilst also cutting benefits, uh, making things harder for the most vulnerable people. It's cruel and it's absolutely unnecessary to have removed the um, universal um, um, uh, uh, uplift during the pandemic, which of course didn't benefit everybody uh, on benefits and then further reduced benefits. So instead of addressing it, it's, it's a combination of factors which actually are pushing to make things worse for the most vulnerable and wider in society as well. Um, it bets big on, in their words, not mine, it bets big on nuclear, on hydrogen, um, uh, and as I've already said, it revisits a homegrown fossil fuel uh, agenda, which Gabriel and others will speak, uh, and Tina will speak about this return to um, investment in, in, in UK based fossil, fossil fuels. Um, I'll talk very briefly about nuclear and hydrogen and fossil fuels um, at the end, but what I will say is what it doesn't do is actually address um, energy efficiency. Um, it has nothing to say whatsoever about um, the real changes that could be made to our homes through insulation and retrofitting, um, which would reduce bills permanently um, and uh, immediately. If those programmes were rolled out uh, permanently and, and immediately, the retrofitting programmes. And it is worth saying that when it comes to retrofitting and insulation, not only would it reduce bills and cut back on our demand for energy, but it would also create a huge number, a huge number of jobs. And Wolfgang will speak in more detail about what the potential is in terms of both energy efficiency, um, uh, uh, the impact on climate change, but also in terms of, 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 job, of job creation. And this failure to talk about energy efficiency comes on the back of other failed strategies over you know decade and a half of of Tory governments failing um, in in this in this way, um, with the most recent one, the Green Homes Grant, a, a load of money shoveled in that direction, very very ineffectual in terms of the number of homes. I mean, they're minuscule um, that will tackle the number of jobs that were created, um, and yet again another failed parked uh, attempt to deal with um, to deal with with energy. Uh, with energy efficiency and it has to be our, one of our number one demands of the movement. We need a mass retrofitting uh, insulation uh, um, um, uh, uh, program and to quote one of the government's own uh, advisors in 2011, uh, the free market has not delivered energy efficiency in any country in the world and it's not going to now so it needs to be a public program of public jobs, public investment um, in public, public ownership to deliver the programme that is needed. In terms of energy itself, very, very, very briefly, because other speakers will, will, will speak about it, betting big on a homegrown nuclear fossil fuel um, programme. This is a catastrophe for the climate as we know. Absolutely no more investment in fossil fuels should be taking place. Every from now on, the fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. And it is an absolute fallacy that this investment will reduce energy prices. As we know, it is um, a market that's set globally and benefits some big corporations, not reduces energy bills, as well as creating the climate catastrophe that, that we are facing. Um, the energy strategy also fails to address the failed energy market that exists in, in, in the UK. This is one energy market which fails to pass on the cheapness of renewable energy because the, 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 the electricity prices are set by the price of gas, 
rather than actually any uh, any pass on of the reduction in the very cheapness of, of renewable energy at this moment in time, which then is then fed by propaganda from the government to suggest that somehow renewable energy or um, is causing our increase in 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 in, in energy uh, in energy costs, or at least to create that kind of um, uh, impression that it can't deliver cheap uh, cheap energy in the way that we know that it can. In terms of nuclear, we, 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 for us in, the, in, in Camp Against, we very much said that this is not the way to go. And let's just list some reasons. In the last decade, there is only one energy source that has increased its cost um, in, in terms of you know, intrinsically increased its cost, if you, if you like, and that is nuclear. It remains the most expensive form of energy. It has a long history of overruns in terms of how long it takes uh, for those uh, for, for the plants to come on and the increased cost of it. This is a way of increasing our energy costs. And finally, it is absolutely tied to nuclear weapons um, and to um, uh, uh, we don't want to add in any way to a dangerous world at this moment in time. Nuclear proliferation, the expansion of nuclear weapons um, at this very dangerous moment in, 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 in time is the wrong way to go. And we have to take up the arguments against it and stand firm against it. Renewable energies, however, are um, the way to go. They are the cheapest, wind, uh, solar uh, uh, and water energy are the cheapest. And if we had investment in them, we can re uh, reduce our reliance on, on fossil um, on, on fossil fuels quite uh, um, systematically. But if we are doing this without addressing the energy market, um, the benefits don't come to, to the people who need them. All of us who need low energy bills, um, they sit instead in the profits of, of, of big businesses, um, not fully passed on to us. And therefore it's absolutely crucial, I would argue, for us to argue for renewable energy at this moment in time, but argue for renewable energy in the context of a publicly owned energy system in which energy again becomes a public good. Um, and all of the decisions that are made around energy are to do with making sure that energy is affordable, making sure that energy uh, addresses, our energy needs address the climate crisis um, and all benefits are plowed back into creation of, of an effective system um, um, uh, under, public, under public ownership. Um, I haven't mentioned hydrogen, but so let me say a couple of sentences on it. There's a lot of talk about hydrogen but hydrogen based on fossil fuels and carbon capture and storage essentially will cement fossil fuels into our energy system. And any hydrogen that comes from uh, renewable, renewable energy is, 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 is a waste of that resource um, when that renewable energy could be used in different places. All of this energy security strategy sits alongside failure in so many other fronts. And I will just mention the failure in terms of public transport at a time when we should be investing in public transport, what's happening at this moment in time is further cuts to public transport, uh, forcing more people back into private transport, into cars, and the government happy to see this with some kind of big um, infrastructure project around everybody having an electric car, which is not the way to go. My final point is this for the other speakers come in. Um, we're all gathered up here tonight to listen uh, to, um, uh, excellent speakers talk about what's wrong with the government's strategy and to talk about what the alternatives are. Um, we also have to, I think, come together to think about how we do build a moment, uh, a, a movement, sorry, at this absolutely crucial time. There's the need for us to fight in terms of individual campaigns, but there's also the need to come together to raise some clear demands across uh, the, the, the movement and to look to ways to build a movement on the streets, in the workplaces and in our communities that can actually fight to, to deliver um, those, those demands. So tonight is about uh, understanding what, what is wrong about the government's energy strategy, but also about thinking how do we best unite together to form a strong and powerful movement that can push back that agenda and fight for the demands that really will um, uh, tackle the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis and the, crime, and the climate crisis. Claire, I'll stop there. Hi, Suzanne. The Zoom doesn't want to seem to highlight me today, but seems to be doing okay with other people. Um, I'd like to um, 
bring in uh, uh, Ruth from Fuel Poverty Action, please. I think Ruth, you're still on mute. So sorry. Okay. Uh, I think probably quite a few people here remember Climate Camp. Uh, many people don't know that Fuel Poverty Action was actually born at Climate Camp at the end of that uh, massive movement uh, against climate change. Uh, many of us wanted to organize against both climate change and austerity. And we insisted in the face of uh, quite a consensus at that time, uh, we insisted that there was no contradiction, that uh, in fact, despite all the desperate messaging from the fossil fuel industry, affordable and sustainable go together and we could fight for both. Uh, and that is actually more and more accepted now, but it's not just a matter of saying it. Uh, policies have to be implemented in a way that makes it come true so that people don't actually uh, suffer from uh, policy, suffer economically from policies that are designed uh, to be green. Um, and uh, I think people know now that insulation, if it's done right, means massive savings, both on emissions and cost. And as well, of course, huge uh, numbers, less people dying or pensioners staying in bed half the day because it's the only way to keep warm, which is a hell of a way to spend our last years. Um, uh, less people with pneumonia, uh, less uh, heart attacks, less suicides, less children who can't do their homework because the whole family squashed into one room or they don't have internet connection or even the power to power it. Uh, people know that. Um, I think people are beginning to get the message that renewables are actually cheaper, although a lot don't realize that actually uh, energy from renewables costs a quarter of what the price of energy from gas. I think that could be uh, far uh, better advertised. Uh, and uh, also the, that this is the same for nuclear energy. In our view, what uh, Suzanne talk, talked about, the, the cost, the financial cost of nuclear energy, let alone the safety, uh, the financial costs would simply rule this out as a, you know, a way forward in, in terms of um, uh, energy sources. Um, we do a lot of work with people in social housing and also on housing estates that are like private leasehold. Um, and we found a lot of popular demand for solar uh, from people in our networks that is on houses, but also on like tower blocks. Um, there is a murkier picture, however, on what people feel about heat pumps and district heating. Um, these both can be done very well, can produce energy that is uh, cheaper and um, uh, safer uh, and causes less emissions, but they are often done so badly in this country, uh, you know, badly designed, uh, badly uh, maintained, badly installed, uh, badly run. Uh, done so badly just for private profit and the, a lot of money going into all sorts of hands that is paid by the customer, um, that uh, it's little wonder that they actually cost the earth and people are then turned off anything green. I mean, this was supposed to be green, but I'm, I don't want to have it. Um, and even insulation needs care. It has to be non-flammable. It has to be non-toxic and it has to be accountably installed. Otherwise you will have a reaction against that as well. We cannot have, we cannot end fossil fuels at the expense of people going cold or uh, not being able to afford uh, to heat their homes. And there is no need for that. Um, I have very little time, so I'll just say that one big protection that would help in this is what we're calling energy for all. We're actually in the process now of starting a campaign for everyone to have a band of energy free to cover our basic needs, uh, to keep warm, keep the lights on, keep the fridge on, uh, cook, uh, and so on. And we um, we uh, started a petition for that on change.org and it took off like a rocket. We'd never seen anything like it. Um, it now has 353,000 <laughs> signatures. Um, and I think one of the factors was that it was a huge relief for many people uh, to uh, see a proposal for pricing that is not based on the market, 
but is based on human need. Um, and especially now, you know, when uh, so many people are simply unable to even conceive how they could begin to meet their needs uh, for energy, given what's happened to the prices, uh, this would be a way to get some security in our lives. That is energy security, not energy security strategy for a country, but energy security for people uh, and health security as well. It would also be a move against fossil fuels. And I want to say three ways. Uh, one is that it would be funded by windfall taxes on fossil fuels and an end to fossil fuel subsidies. It would also be funded by higher prices for people who use way above their allocation, uh, the, you know, the amount that you need for, for your basic needs. A lot of people don't care how much they use and some of them can be made to care. The present pricing system is upside down. That works because of the standing charge. You actually pay less per unit of energy the more you use. Totally perverse. You pay more the less you use so that people who are cutting down to practically zero, which are a lot of people now, and people who cut down for climate reasons as well, are stuck with a huge standing charge, which actually went up on the 1st of April. And that is a policy that we're fighting off Gem over. Um, and it, you know, this is a, it's a matter of basic social justice. It is true that with energy for all, some people will use more energy and that's good because they won't be dying as 10,000 did even before COVID and even before the price rises because they couldn't heat their homes. But some people, will use less energy because you know, they, they won't be able to just um, be profligate with it anymore. So in line with this, we are proposing an audit, which uh, because what you need, you know, if you're doing it according to need, need depends on your age, your household size, your health and your housing. In fact, a lot of this information is gathered already. You know, there's EPCs, uh, the government knows who has a pension, who has a blue badge and so on. You need a lot more energy if you're heating the street because your home is uninsulated or it's damp or it's in bad repair. And up to now, that extra energy has been a cost to us. But suddenly, if the government is out of these windfall taxes and fossil fuel subsidies that are no longer going in that direction, if they are actually paying to meet people's basic needs, suddenly there's an incentive for the government to get on with insulating homes, putting up solar panels and so on. And that is obviously a big move against, uh, against fossil fuels. We are launching this campaign. We're looking for organizations as well as individuals to sign the petition. We're looking for organizations to sign on to it. You can look at our website and see where you can do that. Uh, and we're looking for help working out the implications, the possibilities and how it fits in with other ways of bringing down fossil fuels. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but I had seven minutes, so there you have it. Thanks, Ruth. That's brilliant and very inspiring that <laughs> the campaign has taken off so much. Um, so um, we've had um, at least one request in the chat to start talking about solutions. I think you got onto that, and um, certainly um, Wolf, Wolfgang will, will he's the next person that I'm going to bring in to talk about um, making our homes safe and warm. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so firstly, I was, I'm just going to go have a quick look at the bit of the energy strategy that's uh, supposed to address um, building and energy efficiency, um, and then talk about solutions and action that we can take, because I think that is the thing that's been missing. And that's interesting that in the chat, a lot of people are talking about um, just stop oil, because there is a form of action involved in that. First thing is that the document includes a couple of basic lies um, that or misprints or whatever the whatever the going term is for, for not telling the truth. Um, in the document, they say that this government, they imply that the government is, is that the amount of homes in the UK that has an energy performance certificate rating of C or above, which is the, the supposed standard for being kind of decent. Um, is uh, 46 percent of homes which is true uh, these certificates are not um, totally reliable but that is true and it says they were at nine percent in 2008 i.e when labor was in well actually that's not true there were no figures for 2008 that's when they came in in 2009 they were at 39 percent so actually over the last 12 years we've improved the amount of homes that are at that very basic level 
by about half a percent a year. So it's not it's nothing like what they're saying. They're implying that they've radically improved it, and I don't know where that came from. On energy efficiency, there's not a lot in there about reducing in the whole report about reducing the energy that we use. The whole report is full of words like growth and speed and uh, increasing the amount of energy that's provided. Um, but I am going to have to kind of talk about some of these figures. So I'm, I'm going to hopefully be able to do it within the time available. Um, the figures that they're putting in are uh, either completely inadequate or complete gobbledygook. So um, the first thing they say is that by 2025, 700,000 homes will be upgraded. And um, that would need them to do 300,000 upgrades a year, starting almost immediately and spend about six billion pounds a year, even if it was basic upgrades, um, which would leave, and then they said the rest are gonna be done by 2050, which would leave them having to triple the amount they're doing in those years and spend a lot more money. So it's, um, it's an inadequate figure and it's not properly costed. In terms of actually what they suppose you can do to the homes other than fit heat pumps, they just talk about cavity wall insulation, which is of limited use to a limited number of homes and carries with it all sorts of dangers and, and not really adequate to the task. The kind of a stone age response. And a lot of the policy that the government comes up with is um, based on the fact that they, they don't really understand this area. And that's not because I think I understand it that I'm saying that. I'm saying that because they, what they actually understand is very little. It's not just this area, it's a whole lot of other areas. And really it's the working people in the different sectors and the people who are actually having to deal with fuel poverty who do understand and can get into the detail and, um, and the government doesn't bother asking them. Um, they make a big point about not imposing this um, um, upgrade on homes on people, gradual transition following the grain of behavior. Um, and just so that we've got it in our heads, then I'm gonna to have to move on from these numbers. To actually upgrade um, homes to a level where they could actually potentially use a heat pump or radically use less energy, whatever their heating form is, you're going to need to spend at the moment about 50,000 pounds a home in reality, even though in practice, in theory, a few years ago, you could have said for 20,000, you could get a lot done. But as you do more of them, that cost should come down. But on those kind of numbers, the, the amount that they're offering is, um, is only going to cover a, a very, very small number of homes. And, uh, and then, so, so just get that figure on table. To actually address the problem, we need to be spending about 60 billion pounds a year for an average of 20,000 pounds a home. Um, and so their numbers are not adequate. I, I, I'm a bit rushed. I feel a bit rushed to go through the numbers properly. I've only really been looking Sorry, at Sorry, Wolfgang, can I just, yeah. I've had a couple of people saying that your volume's a bit low. I'm not sure if there's any technical fix, but just make sure you're speaking clearly because there's a couple of comments in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you can do, that'd be fab, thank you. Where that can be adjusted, it's not in the... Um, I can't seem to... I can't see if just it. I'm just going to have to shout then, I think, because my speakers are on maximum. Um, there's another another big shot in the in the thing that, that the gas boilers were due to be phased out in 2025. In 2019, the Chancellor announced this, or Philip Hammond announced it, and everyone was in shock. And now they've put that back by 10 years. They just quietly changed the number to 2035. Um, and so, so that's some of, some of the figures. And really what I'm saying is that their, their, their numbers are not adequate. And you need to spend about 60 billion pounds a year on average to address it. And you also need to employ a lot of people to do the work. And I think why, why this is the case, there's a number of reasons that some of them have been already talked about. But if you contrast, it's a, it's a lot to do with the way that capitalism works. If you had, um, uh, if you wanted to design a single product with some expert people around it, 
Uh, Capgemini is very good at doing that. So Apple, for example, could actually design a new technical product or going to the moon. A few experts can design a product which can then be rolled out and become very, very profitable. But in the case of retrofit, you need to make millions of experts. You need to make people understand the process if they're living in their homes, and you need to make ordinary building workers understand the process too. So you need to spread that expertise in a much wider layer of people. And that's uh, and the profit rates are very much lower. And so therefore it's very unattractive for capitalism. And it also requires a lot of thought and a lot of planning, and it requires bringing in the education sector. And so all of these reasons are reasons why a government of any not modern time doesn't like dealing with it because they just want to stay in power and look popular and do the bare, bare minimum. But they also want to make sure that the people that they support are getting work out of this. So they'd rather promote heat pumps at very large numbers, even before heat pump technology has got proper standards and the installation people have been trained. Um, I, I, a regular game, I ask gas engineers whether they've installed a heat pump or whether they've been on a course with and the answer is even the brightest ones are just thinking about getting onto some training for this. Um, so so they, they're not interested in doing that. The only people who can force that are the working people, because we have the expertise and we have the organizations, whether that be unions or cooperatives or community groups or residential groups or you know, fuel poverty action groups and all of these things. So um, the things that we can do. I think uh, we can, uh, I have a lot more numbers at my behest, but I think I can probably come back on questions about that. Um, but um, our program would get most, would get nearly every home in the UK down to half of its current energy use within 10 years and would rise up gradually to employ 2 million people specifically on that. And I say rise up gradually. And I think this is really, really important. And it's something that, that we, that people are tempted to say all over the place on our side of the argument as well as on others that you could just click your fingers and they could do it tomorrow. Well, they can't. And I'd love to show a couple of slides. Can you see the screen that I've got here? So this is some um, scheme I've been involved in. That's early days when we were looking at all the problems with the workers. This is the actual installations. Can you see, can people see the screen? I can't get any feedback. There's some pictures of windows. Yeah. The one on the right has got water going up to there. And the reason for that is that the people who are doing it are in a hurry, they don't know what they're doing, they've got so much work that they really see this as a burden to do this job properly, and they've had to do triple glazing for the first time, and they've gone to some firm that's probably never done it before, and it's failed, and the water's gotten in, and it's now a little uh, thin goldfish bowl. When they put the windows in, they don't bother preparing the opening, they just put it in. Now, I'm not having a go at workers here, I'm saying that the industry at the moment is geared to very low standards, and very fast work rates, and there's so much work for them that they'll move on to something else. So to change that, you need you need a larger supply of workers and you need contracts that are properly controlled. And we've said one of the key ways to do that is to get local councils to reinstate their direct labor organization and to get you know um, uh, a higher standard which needs to be enforced. You need to train the people to inspect things as well. Having said that, I'll just move on. Here's the house before and here's the house after. And this is going to be a lot better despite the uphill struggle of getting the quality of work. Because when you actually talk to the workers involved, they want to do a better job. The industry is just structured and the government spending is just structured to, to get them to basically the, the famous phrase, pit and forget and run away. So that's, um, so that's that. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so the things that we can do are we can put motions through our unions, yes. We should be actually bringing placards to demonstrations which actually call for specific positive things like insulating homes. And um, we should be carrying these arguments as people are doing, and I'm seeing it all around the country with retrofit fairs and retrofit events and um, Zoom meetings, obviously. But I think when it comes to the questions that people have raised about Insulate Britain, I've attended the Insulate Britain um, workshops for people who are in the field, and I think that there is a role for the sort of um, protests that get the news. But what our specialty in the campaign against uh, climate change the trade union group has got to be is to bring larger numbers of people into protests that can also capture the news, but allow them to get away without being nicked and beaten up. 
And I think that's our, our USP, is to get large numbers of people involved, carrying placards, yes, maybe temporarily blocking things or standing in front of a petrol station or whatever else, but we need to do it uh, in a way that can be sanctioned by our union branches and our district and, um, and bring larger numbers of people to bear on it, because that could actually change government policy even before the government changes. Um, I probably, yeah, I've gone on loads, sorry. Okay. okay. Can you stop sharing your screen? Right, thanks. I think um, that was a really good point to end on, which is um, talking about um, that mass mass movement element. And then, um, and I think you know, it might seem odd to hear sort of someone talking about um, the climate and you know. We'll be criticizing how insulation might be done, but I think that really comes out in Ruth's presentation as well. That you know we need to, we need to be putting people first, and there's absolutely no contradiction between wanting to put wanting to cut carbon and putting people first. So um, I think um, we've got three more speakers, but I think for now we should give people an opportunity to um, uh, ask some questions and maybe make some brief comments. Um, if you just put your hand up, that would be, fab. I can see um, Hugh has done so straight away. So go for it, Hugh. Yeah, I've done, I've done it very quickly for two reasons. I've got to go in a bit because I've got an organising meeting for Bristol Climate Summit, which I think we think is going to be very, very big. Um, so, so I think it raises an opportunity there, uh, which connects with deeply with what's been said, is I guess I've been struggling, and we people are organising this. We want this have this climate summit and come out at the other side with some practical agitational uh, bits to it, um, if you like, so that we can mobilise. Um, because in one sense, the crisis can appear and it is vast. How does that whittle down to, in my situation, Bristol? What what are the things we can agitate around, and what can we demand and be very concrete? Which um, uh, I think we've had lots of discussions ar uh, around. For example, the question of free public transport. I know organisations have tried a bit of agitation around that, and people it hasn't really taken off, if I'm honest. So I just want some, um, I guess, some thoughts about that. What what. What can we do locally to in terms of uh, in terms of coming out of our summit and agitating around? And I was very obviously under Wolfgang's partly in Bristol about those sort of demands about retrofit and what people thoughts are. Sorry, a bit garbled, but that was my question. Not garbled. Good question, uh, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes, we am. Yep. Okay, um, I wanted to, to um, respond to Wolfgang's very last slide, probably just because it was the very last thing I saw. Um, now, perhaps I misunderstood it. It looks as if it says we're going to need 36 million jobs to, um, to, to um, do all the retrofitting we need. Um, okay, that doesn't need explaining because I don't think there's that, that, there's, um, that many people working in the UK. Um, so so um, and I'd like to know more about what, um, what, what, what that figure means. And also, um, how do we actually introduce those jobs in practice? Because um, we can't rely on the government to do it. I've put something about electoral reform in, in the um, in in the chat already, but um, we probably haven't got that long. Okay, so I just I'll, I'll just ask you to respond to that. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Hi. Hiya. Um, hope you can hear me all right. I'm outside. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is a heat pump? Sorry for my ignorance. I've heard that before, but I don't actually know how it works. Wolfgang, would you be able to um, come in quickly to respond to those last two points? They seem they're aimed at you, I think. Yeah, starting with the heat pump. So in principle, the heat pump, there's, um, if, if you take the outside air, or if you take a, a pond, or if you take the ground, there's a lot of heat in it, but it's spread out at very low levels. So the temperature is quite low, but the heat overall is quite a lot, because it's a big slab of material. And the heat pump concentrates that heat and takes it into your house so you can use it. It's, uh, it's always described as a fridge in reverse. The fridge takes the heat out of your food and dissipates it into the air, and the, the, the heat pump uses the refrigerant. And the practical, uh, there, are, there are diagrams that explain it better than I can, but the practical consequences are 
if you could put in uh, one kilowatt of electricity and get two and a half kilowatts of heat out of it. Um, so that's a very sweet spot. If you make your house nice and snug, then a heat pump becomes cheaper than a gas boiler to run, even though electricity costs two or three, well, three times as much as gas. So that's what a heat pump is. Um, and look it up otherwise, but I'm sorry, that's not, you know, that's my best shot. The jobs, yeah, it's 3.6 million uh, jobs. Now that spreadsheet um, was based on starting, uh, it was a calculator that said, here is how many people I know actually are trained at the moment. And here's how many people, how many building workers we've got already available, but not trained. And how can we grow that number in a sensible way so that people train other people, but they're also still working. It's not madness to think of this escalator. So at any given uh, year, the, the column, I'll put this back up. Let me just share the screen one more time, just because it's, uh, I didn't expect to show this. Um, can you see the thing now? Yeah, so if you look at the number of trained workers, we start in the first year, obviously we can use this all along a year now, with 500 trained building workers. And then the next year, 24,000. And by the end of that 10 year period, we've got half a million who've been given the full training, which includes the physics of building and how to do weapons properly. They can actually, each one of them can actually show four people what to do. I've, I've seen this in practice over the last six months. It's really, this has been very gratifying to see that real life experience does marry with the, um, the theory. And then they can do a certain number of homes. But for every job that's actually building a home, there's also jobs in making the equipment and the materials. And that's where the extra jobs come in. So at the end of the 10 year period, at that point in time, our army, if you like, will have 2 million people involved in the retrofit, which is the figure I mentioned, and another 1.6 million people involved in the materials. And that's based on economists, normal factoring, and various reports that have come out on this issue. So again, I wouldn't hold us to those figures exactly, but that is the kind of scale we're talking about in my view. So I know to unshare now, don't I? Um, well, oh, it's I not, it I wasn't have... showing, it didn't actually share. I just, Never mind. Just, I uh, recommend um, that I'll put it in the link. I'll put the link yeah, to it. That'd be great. Um, Steve was next. It's not so much a question, but I do think it's absolutely right that the uh, living crisis, of course, is caused by the energy crisis is is something that really is an opportunity for us to <coughs> to uh, take action because there are lots of people who, who are going to want to fight over that and we we have something to say and we can be part of it i mean in kent we are actually looking at doing uh, a protest in the uh, constituency of Craig McKinley MP, who is actually the leader of the uh, Net Zero Scrutiny Group. The, uh, these are the people who are uh, essentially uh, climate deniers and are attempting to block even the appalling, uh, the inadequate government uh, things. So I think there is a real possibility of, of, ex of bringing in a lot more people and, and pushing our arguments and making them more wider known, which of course is what we want. And I think that really does offer us the opportunity. Martin, next. Hi, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can win because I think we're going to face as environmentalists, as social justice campaigners, as trade unionists, as activists in general, a massive assault from this government. And I don't think yet the environmental movement has quite cottoned on to how severe an attack that is going to be. I mean, I think Suzanne was right to outline the breadth of the assault that's coming, you know, uh, a massive expansion of nuclear power, the potential reopening of fracking, the uh, opening up of Cambo, all of these sort of things, and, you know, renewed emphasis on things like biofuels and, uh, and so on. It's a real rolling back of some of the things we thought we'd won and some of the things I thought we'd, uh, we'd stopped. And, and I, in this, I, I think that there's a danger that the environmental movement becomes fragmented over single issues, that we just focus on our own particular campaign or our own backyard, and we don't do the sort of uh, building of movements that can, can win. And I think there's two really good examples from the recent past about, uh, about how the movement can win. The first, I think, is the Cambo oil field. Because why did they retreat on that? They did it in the aftermath 
of COP26, when thousands of people took to the streets around the country, and particularly in Scotland, and it was clear, well, I mean, you can you can read the press releases from the uh, from the oil companies, they knew that they could, they didn't want to end up spending lots of money on, uh, on, on, on the policing, on, uh, on the extra cost caused by protesters outside the, uh, outside the, um, uh, the, the building of that. The second, I think, is fracking. And I know Tina's going to talk about this in a bit. But how did we get that moratorium on fracking? We got it because we brought together all sorts of different campaigners, campaigners who prepared to sit down and lie down in the road, camp outside the fracking stations, campaigners who were prepared to go around petitioning, campaigners who were prepared to go and talk to the trade unionists and say, actually, this is not in our interest, it won't create lots of jobs, etc., etc. We built movements that that linked up arguments around the questions of jobs, uh, 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 health and safety in, in the environs of the uh, fracking plants, as well as the environmental questions. And I think it's that coming together of different sections of the movement, uh, link it into the wider political issues like the cost of living crisis, like the war in Ukraine, and say, actually, we can stop these, but there has uh, that the, the, the it requires unity and so on. And the final thing is we have to pose concrete alternatives. That said, I'm not against bashing the, uh, the, the government. I think actually one of the problems that the environmental movement faces is that a lot of people don't understand why these are such big attacks on working people. And actually we do have to bash the government to highlight exactly why what's going wrong. Nonetheless, the things like the climate jobs report are actual real concrete examples of how there's an alternative that can provide cheap uh, energy, warm houses, better public transport, at the same time as not uh, affecting the uh, the environment in the way that fossil fuel capitalism does. But it requires mass social movements from below to do it. Mun movements that unite environmental activists with trade unionists, with radicals on the left, with uh, all sorts of campaigners that say, actually, we can have a better future if we uh, if we stand together. And I think the lessons are there about how we've won in the past. We're just going to have to dust off some of those, uh, those books and, uh, and repeat it. Thanks, Martin. I can see two people have got their hands up and then after them, I think we'll go back to um, our next speakers. So, Linda, please. Um, just like to endorse really what Martin was saying, that we we all need to come together. It's the ideal campaign to focus around because everyone cares about cost of living and, and what's happening with energy bills. Um, and maybe Campaign Against Climate Change are, are the ideal group to try and bring everybody together because you've got very good trade union contacts. And I know Friends of the Earth are working on a similar campaign, and I think Greenpeace are too. The Green New Deal hubs are looking at a joint campaign on energy and cost of living pri crisis and retrofitting. New Economics Foundation are working on it. It'd be great to work with Fuel Poverty Action. So if we could bring all these organisations together fairly quickly uh, to launch a major campaign at all levels. So we're doing the, the on the street stuff and the lobbying um, and, and the high level uh, research and information, uh, but all basically focusing on the same thing. And as any, any F want to do, bringing in lots of the people who are most directly affected by it, people living in social housing and council housing who desperately need their homes retrofitted. Um, so we've got a great variety of voices involved in the campaign. Thanks. And Malcolm? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting meeting. Thanks, thanks for organising it. Um, I just wanted to say we we we've had a campaign, and I want to talk a little bit. Just I mentioned it in the chat about development companies because few fossil fuel companies obviously are terrible, but so are many of these development companies. They just build housing which nobody can afford. They just build warehousing, treat land as profit get rid of biodiversity and just, just wreck the environment completely in quite a lot of places. And there's a lot of campaigns around the country, and we were one. I mean, we had 3,000 3, people on a Facebook site. We had demonstrations, and I think really in practice, I think we did a bit, little bit of what people are saying. We linked it to climate change because losing a 1,000 trees was directly to do that biodiversity. Was it, we was enabled to have the, the first demonstration actually in Macafield on climate change, where we got trade unions, the RMT involved, that talked about public transport, which we thought was really positive. To the extent we was going knocking on council estates, which in the middle of nowhere, really, overlooking.
looking, I were looking this land. And basically people were understood climate change because we linked it to what was going on locally and, and the two together. And it ended up, we had a big protest outside when the plan decision was made. The planning officers recommended it. And in the end, the councils overturned it. And it was a massive victory. And, and I think um, we can win these things. And I think we've got to widen it out and link everything together, cost of living, development companies. And actually, actually, when they reckon you lose local campaigns, it's not about NIMBYism. It's about people caring about space. People have fought for space. And it's all linked to climate change. So thanks for the meeting. And I hope in practice we've done a little bit, maybe what, what you've been saying. Thanks very much. Thank you. There'll be more recording. There's more chance for um, discussion later. But um, Gabriel, if you could um, talk about your campaign, <laughs> there's a lot to say. I know. Thank you. Yeah. No. No problem at all. And um, uh, two things. First, just yeah. Thanks for having me. Really, like such a great group of people. Um, so really, yeah. I feel lucky to be here. And apologies if you hear a, a dog barking in the background. Uh, it's one of the, the joys and, and trials of working from home. Um, so yeah, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Stop Cambo campaign, um, which is uh, essentially like a, a loose coalition of a bunch of different organizations, um, some big, some small uh, across the UK with a good healthy number in Scotland. Um, and basically what we've been doing is working um, largely towards an end of oil and gas extraction in the UK through a managed phase out and just transition. Um, and the way we've been going about doing that is first with this campaign against Cambo, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and now we're expanding it out to the new fields that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so basically I can talk a little bit about kind of what um, the challenges are and what we're facing and what we're seeing from the government. And then a little bit more towards like the solution side and, and kind of our plans. Um, for the rest of this year. Um, but essentially, Cambo was really the first of this kind of engine revving up of new oil and gas fields moving down the pipeline. There's about 42 projects that are currently slated for approval or decisions before um, 2025. And the emissions of these projects, if they all go ahead, equal um, to the annual, double the annual emissions of, of the entire United Kingdom. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to help um, support and kind of galvanize different campaigns to target these fields, particularly the fields that can kind of threaten the um, entire sort of economics of, of the industry while connecting and supporting um, folks that are like many on this call, um, campaigning to, to reduce demand for oil and gas, um, scale up renewables, and also like work to coordinate um, for a just transition. So the, the first field that we focused on was Cambo. It was mainly put forward by Shell and a um, private equity um, sort of sponsored company called Sicker Point Energy that got paused at the end of last year after Shell announced that they were pulling out and um, the company who was mainly responsible was left a little bit in the cold and trying to figure out what to do next. Um, one thing that was really effective last year and what we're trying to look to replicate this year is all of the opposition parties came out strongly against Cambo um, and the Scottish government did. Um, so a big focus for us this year is kind of reaffirming that commitment towards all new oil and gas extraction um, and not having it just be this project of Cambo, but looking at it, sort of all the new fields coming down the pipeline. Um, and so the focus that we have right now is a new field called Jackdaw uh, that's been put forward by Shell. It's 100% owned and operated by Shell. Um, it's currently kind of in the government's hands deciding if they want to approve the project or not. Shell is essentially using the war in Ukraine and the energy price crisis to justify this field and even kind of taking an eye back again to Cambo. Um, we know, like um, was said on this call earlier, new oil and gas, uh, particularly in the North Sea and throughout the UK, won't lower energy bills at all. It won't help energy security. Um, this gas that would come from this jackdaw gas field belongs to Shell. They can sell it to whoever they want at whatever price that the market dictates, uh, but that doesn't stop them from continuing to kind of position themselves like they're um, kind of coming in like on a white horse trying to save uh, the UK's energy security. Um, so what we're doing is really trying to push um, opposition politicians to come out and take a stand and then slowly putting more pressure onto the conservative government. Shell's up for approval right now. It's kind of the active fight 
And then there's two massive fields that are coming down the pipeline. One of them is Rosebank. Um, it's about double the size of Cambo, so just a, a pretty much a monster. And we expect that will start to take off towards the end of this year when it'll actually go into the formal process. Um, and then Claire South, which is another massive field. Um, this one is um, put forward by BP. So those kind of two well-known um, baddies in, in the space. Uh, another thing that we're trying to do um, in our work is I think last year we had a lot of the sort of tailwinds of um, COP26 and the government wanting to kind of posture themselves as these climate leaders that put them in a really uncomfortable position. Um, what we're finding now is that, you know, because of the energy crisis, because of the cost of the main scandal, um, because of the war in Ukraine, they've really doubled down on new oil and gas drilling, um, as well as just doing, you know, what folks have said, nothing at all to actually address the, you know, real, what would really address rising energy prices. So we're really pulling out these, um, the facts that, you know, Shell and BP um, in the past, you know, three, four years have actually paid negative tax in the UK. We paid, the UK government paid them money. They also made these record profits. Um, and actually next week on the third and the fifth, Shell and BP are gonna announce their quarterly profits. And we're expecting those to be in the billions as well. Um, so really do everything we can to join up these campaigns that are sort of field focused, have like the wider UK continental shelf as a basin um, in mind with the demands of, of everyone that are looking at the real solutions to to rise in energy bills. So um, fuel efficiency, cutting demand, upscaling and renewables, all of that. Um, and I think maybe just one um, kind of like perspective on, on the North Sea as a whole um, is that it's really uh, an aging basin. There's not a lot of new oil and gas out there. There's not enough. We could take all the oil and gas out of the North Sea. There's no guarantee it would make any dent in the, the global price for, for oil and gas. We could take it all out. We'd still have to import oil and gas. So all these arguments are just kind of um, really about the shareholders and the profits these companies want to make and the connections with the government um, and how they're still very much kind of taking their side. So some of the things you might have seen recently around um, Pretty Patel taking a 100,000 pound donation from an oil and gas trader the conservatives getting about 1.3 million um, since 2019 from oil and gas and climate skeptics. So we're, we're also looking at how we can expose some of these um, connections and try to create some uncomfortable situations for politicians to have to answer for what they're doing. Um, so sorry, I think I'm just about maybe over time, but I'll share some links if folks want to get involved. Um, and I think really importantly is we recognize that focusing on stopping the fields is very much only one part of the answer. And so really keen to support uh, and work with other folks on all these other issues like windfall tax, pushing energy efficiency, retrofitting, um, you know, removing the blocks to offshore wind, onshore wind, however, however we can help. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, that's great. I mean, it's just so illogical to the idea that, um, you know, this new oil and gas drilling is going to build, bring energy bills down because the, the companies are literally interested in it because they think that the energy prices are going to stay high that's why it's profitable for them to go to go in for these now uh, next person um to speak is um a great example of successful campaigning against fossil fuels that has been happening in the uk so um if i could bring in tina thanks evening all so good to look around the room and see names and faces that I've met on front lines and know that we've all supported each other's campaigns and how much that always meant to it was, you know, like I'm looking at Judy right now and remembering how many times I saw that lovely little face walk up the hill at PNR and, and what that does for us, you know, and meetings like this is so important for maintaining our contacts and our networks. And so we can reach out to each other and try to find better ways to work together. Certainly with the anti-fracking movement where we are is, well, where we started was back in 2011 when it was first uh, raised in the UK. And for up until November 2019, we were fighting at every step of the way. And we had we kept winning and we also kept losing. So 2015, we won, we overturned, um, we, we got the council to say no to fracking at a site here in Lancashire at Preston New Road and at Rosica. 
um, and then the government overturned it. Now, that was kind of beneficial to us in many ways, because for a lot of people in the area who weren't that sure about how they felt about fracking, did know how they felt about local democracy. And, you know, the absence of that, the fact that Westminster could just say, you know, what your council said and what you all said in your complaints and your objections means nothing to us. And we will overturn that. So that was a big turning point, I think, in the way that people viewed things like this. Um, and then again, in 2019, after we did a thousand days at the roadside of the anti-fracking site here in Lancashire, um, enough seismic events. It wasn't really, I, I'd say it wasn't us that caused the moratorium, but it was us that made it hard for them to survive it or revive from it. Um, I'd say that we had successes and these are what we would fight for again, should this go through, because right now you will have all heard or seen in the press the raising of fracking again as, an, as a subject. This comes about really just through 26 Tory MPs led by Lord Frost and Steve Baker and their net zero scrutiny group, which is basically climate denialists. But, you know, there are a lot of Tory MPs, too, in seats where, you know, fracking could come, where licenses are, are already granted who are very uncomfortable with having to defend fracking. So I think that we do still stand a very strong ch chance. And I certainly know that within the anti-fracking movement, most of us believe they can't possibly get this through. The reason we think that is that nothing has changed. All that's changed is opportunism. So the government or this certainly this group, this you know net zero scrutiny group has gone, oh, look, there's a war. Let's seize an opportunity amidst all that suffering and say we desperately need fracking at home. But nothing about the situation here has changed. Much like you heard from Gabriel with um, Stop Cambo, it's not going to reduce our prices. Our energy prices will not be reduced. The frack, the fat gas, the shale gas they get out will belong to the company that got it out. They will make the money and it will not be sold to UK residents. It will be sold on the open market like gas and oil is. So there is no gain for us. We also know that the things that worked with regard to bringing them down and making them weaker was that we got in very quickly with getting our messaging across. You know, we shot across the country in those early years doing public meetings in every place where there was a license. We shot there and spoke to the residents. We spoke to them in shopping centers. We arranged public meetings. Uh, we engaged with their counselors, many of whom were so ill-informed that it really helped to give them the information. If nothing else, just to say later, but you knew that, but you knew you had that information. We worked closely with unions and Friends of the Earth and other NGOs to make sure that we had the best access to legal and information and guidance. And I'd say one of the most successful things we did was to financially impact the companies, because when you think about it, what's going to hurt an oil or gas company? It's not that we're upset or that the public don't want it. What they care about is reputation, power, and finance. So we literally watched the stock exchange to see what actions that we did had an impact on their share price. And when we impacted their reputation, that was huge. But then we were guided by um, various other, Reclaim the Power was one of the groups that advised us on impacting the supply chain. And that was huge, that made a big difference. So we had, um, a property developer, and I think someone, I think it was Hugh earlier, meant, asked a question about the way the property developers, you know, we don't talk about them. But, you know, there's companies that serve, um, like the fracking industry, to build that shale gas site, who are also building other property developments in the area. So we spoke directly to them and said that if they continue to supply the shale gas site, then we would take our protests to the gates of wherever it was they were working. And this just scared the life out of them. We didn't actually realize it would have the impact it did, but it was rather marvelous because, you know, you ended up with some companies pulling out like Armstrong's. And then what's that really big trucking company that everyone collects little trucks from? I can't remember what they're called now. Oh, Eddie Stobart, that's it. Um, who swore they would not provide um, services to the fracking companies. So, it, you know, you have to impact in what hurts them, not what we feel is important. So, back to the fact that nothing has changed and yet now they're seizing this opportunity i we think that they can't proceed but we think they'll still keep trying but with the local elections due i think there's a lot of quiet now suddenly a lot amongst um the the people in you know certainly in the areas where there are fracking sites 
planned or who have been licensed. Whether they succeed, I, I truly don't. I truly don't believe that. But what would we do if they do? And if it really does become a direct threat again? Well, I think the anti-fracking movement would do the things that succeeded before. And that's that diversity of approach. That's letting everyone do what they are best suited to and not always trying to shape the resistance because shaping that resistance leaves people out. And there are a lot of people who will work in their own way. You know, I may be a vocal point and people know me just because I was at the front and I was loud. But there were thousands of people far more effective who were writing to their councillors, writing to the press, lobbying their MP and doing a great deal of work with research and so on that we don't ever hear about them. But that's what fuels a movement. And that's what leads to success is having that access to the right information. A very really interesting thing I did recently was to work with um, some academics who are looking to set up a service to activists where instead of being at service to you know, the fossil fuel industry, which we see with places like Durham University, they want to set up something where the academics who are feeling so bad about what they're forced to do for money within their universities can actually put their services to us. So I think things like that are really important and really interesting. Um, Ruth, De Ruth earlier was talking about um, fuel poverty. And again, these are the things that people expect that someone like Ruth and I would be in disagreement because she's trying to fight for lowered bills, whereas really Ruth has done such a tremendous job in making it clear that, no, she's totally for the climate and reducing those bills. And I think, again, we need to look at things like where they've seized the opportunity because they've said that, you know, we don't want this Russian fuel, so therefore we're all going to run out of fuel. Well, why are we not instead focusing on the fact that one country's you know, aggressive power um, can be wielded purely because they, they control, they centralised energy, whereas really we need to decentralise energy and power. Um, I think half the problem that we face is that the tools that should be at our disposal as citizens in a democracy are not. We've seen it with the police bill. We've seen it with the way that we're challenged in courts and how none of us can afford lawyers and we can't get through and get legal cases on our side because we just haven't got the money or the expertise. So all of these things are denied to us and the media, you know, the media propagates the worst thing. So I, I realize that's all really negative and I wanted to try and find a way to say, oh no, it's all gotta be positive. So A, yes, I don't, I, I don't believe that fracking will succeed. Our seismology in this country just can't take it. But how do we win at not just that, but at the bigger picture, the whole, climate challenge and the environmental biodiversity society. And I think the only way that we do that is by actions like this, where we come together and we all feed each other the information that we need, how we then rally call to each other to come and support each other's campaigns. Certainly Stop Cambo, I watched that grow so really quickly. You know, it took us ages to really take off. Whereas now we seem to be able to instantly pop into a group like this and and suddenly everyone's aware and we're able to reach out to our networks. And um, I probably rambled on a bit too long. But so, yeah, so the, the past is, is, is done as with fracking as far as we hope. There are risks, of course, that they could, as they have done in some cases, change the terminology around fracking and call it something else. Um, and then that way, you know, by using a little less water or a little less depth or a little more depth, they say that's not actually fracking. It's just you know, extracting shale gas by different means. But, you know, either way, we're not ready to have the wool pulled up over our eyes after 10 years. But we are really fed up with that as well. You know, that the residents here certainly are exhausted and fed up with being scared that this thing will come back. So we need a ban. Um, but, you know, getting that's a, another hope and another dream. Um, but I, but certainly thank you to uh, Campaign for Climate Change um, to for pulling together something like this. And hopefully we can all support and help each other and bring our armies when we need them. Thanks, Tina. That's brilliant. Um, I think it's important to recognise that they did kind of redefine fracking so that after it was mostly banned, there are some there are some campaigns still having to plug away at the sort of, you know, I can't believe it's not butter. I can't believe it's not fracking. Kind yes. Of. <laughs> Although there is still the element that no matter what they do, even if they do it with acid instead of water, so they've changed the name of it. It's, you know, it's, it's acidification. It's still interferes with with our seismology to the point where our seismology will just keep fighting back and we're not the prairies of america you know we are a densely populated island 
and everyone is near everywhere is near someone near a school near a church near a heritage building near a site you know so it's a lot harder for them to take off here and really what they say is down there is doesn't talk about how much of that is accessible because they can say that there is x amount of gas in situ but we can only access access between two and seven percent of that it's so hard to get at you know it's a pipe dream it's a ponzi scheme and it's a ripoff thanks that's brilliant and i especially like the point of earlier about um the diversity within the movement and that everyone's got something to bring to it so our final speaker is Katie from Biofuel Watch, and um, it's uh, we often just focus on fossil fuels, but actually there are um, lots of um, pitfalls that are um, things that are presented as solutions to climate change and are actually going to um, make it worse. We could put a few things under that category, but um, I'm sure Katie will tell us all about it and also about the action that they're organising tomorrow. Thanks, Claire. I'm going to use a presentation. So if you just give me a sec while I share my screen. Um, whoa, hang on. Can everyone see that? Oh, I, keep, I always do this. Sorry. Hang on. Can everyone see that? Cool. Right. Okay. Oh, straight on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I'm from Biofuel Watch. We campaign against all kinds of bioenergy, but our main focus at the at the moment and for the past few years has been um wood biomass and in particular Drax Power Station in Selby, um, which is the world's largest biomass burner and also the UK's single largest carbon emitter. And burns wood from across the globe. None of the wood it burns it comes from the UK. It's all imported. And 60% um, comes from the southern US, with the rest from Canada and the Baltic states. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, and this, this biomass, um, Drax classes it as renewable, and unfortunately the, the government classes it as renewable, um, and they make great attempts to publicise it. For example, on their trains, you can see on the screen, as renewable, um, but essentially what they're doing is, is burning trees. And for this, they receive subsidies. Last year, they received 982 million pounds in renewable subsidies. This is almost entirely from, from, for the wood burning. And the money comes out of a say a charge on UK energy bills. So we pay for Drax to burn trees. There are biodiversity impacts in, in all of the places they source from. In the Southern US, they clear cut forests that are not old enough to be classed as old growth but they are very biodiverse and home to many rare species and lots of other animals for whom it's home. In, the, in Canada, um, they are involved with old growth logging and they've recently bought um, a pin, a Pinnacle Pellets, which is a pellet company there, um, and they have a monopoly on the, on the pellet market now in, um, in Canada. Um, and in Estonia, they've actually there's very, very suggestive evidence that there there's a mature two thousand sites that are being clear felled to be burnt at Drax. Obviously, again, home to wildlife, different animal species. And here in the UK, Drax is on trial for risking the health of its workers. For exposure to wood dust and another impact in the southern US um, not covered in so far is that the pellet mills are real sources of pollution and they're often cited in environmental justice areas where 
population is predominantly poor, predominantly black, with massive health impacts from the wood dust that's produced. Um, so it's classed as renewable, but recently 500 scientists wrote a letter um, warning that burning wood is not renewable and it's where, it, well, it's as bad as coal oil or natural gas. In fact, it's worse because you're removing the trees that would sequester carbon. Um, and this and other links includes, I'll share in the chat afterwards. Drax is now proposing BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. This is like CCS, but with bioenergy. Drax's proposition is more dangerous because they are suggesting that they can actually become carbon negative by not just capturing the carbon when they burn the trees, but by growing more trees, which capture more carbon. They can actually remove carbon from the atmosphere into the future. And um, this is really worrying. It's being factored into climate projections and government policies, but it's a false solution because. Um, it's not a proven technology and Drax admitted itself last year that its assumptions are not based on any trials. Um, this is a really helpful little graphic produced by Fern. Um, and it shows, you know, what, what they suggest on the, on the left, which sounds great. Um, and then the reality on the right is that even if they do successfully capture and store the carbon from burning trees at the stack doesn't include the carbon that would have been sequestered by the trees had they been left standing, the fertilizer use, the machinery used in harvesting, and then the pellet process. And then of course, all of these pellets are transported to the UK on ships, which release a lot of carbon. And then at the end, what we need and what we already have is trees. But but Drax is proposing a planning application. Um, it's due to be submitted imminently. We're going to mobilise people to object. And this is to expand their existing site um, with the BEX technology, which it uses these abine based scrubbers, which degrade into known hard carcinogens. But it's dependent on the success of the Humber pipeline, which is a wider carbon capture project for the region. So we're going to be objecting to that too, along with other groups. That's due a bit later in the year. And then if we if you sign up to or get updates, you can be kept informed on how you can oppose. Um, fortunately for us, the, we already have carbon capture technology. It already exists. It's trees and we need to protect them and restore them. And the oldest trees sequester the most carbon. So planting monoculture plantations to replace those that have been, it, that's not a solution. But it's not all doom and gloom. The money that Drax receives in subsidies, huge amounts, can be redirected to genuine renewable energy, such as wind and solar. And these energy sources already cost much less than biomass or fossil fuels, particularly wind. So these can play a key role in reducing our energy bills and dependence on burning things for electricity. So in the context of the current situation and worries about energy costs and energy security, um, you know, burning trees isn't the answer. Switch moving those subsidies to wind and solar is definitely a really easy ask and part of the solution. Um, and it's something you could do straight away on that is um, contacting your AP, MP to ask to redirect the subsidies. And again, I'll share that link. Um, and unions and groups can also get involved by signing an open letter um, that we've come up with. Um, supporting the redirection of the subsidies. And then, as Claire mentioned, um, oh, hang on, wait, we've got a coalition set up in the Northeast um, and together with Biofuel Watch and Axtrax, we are organising a day of action tomorrow because it's Drax's AGM. And there's also a biomass conference where, well, it's going to be Greenwash City, three days of um, promotion of the biomass industry, including a workshop on how to deal with negative publicity. So we must be having some effect already. Um, there's protests outside the AGM in London and also outside the 
biomass conference again i'll share the links and then there's actions up north in yorkshire and liverpool so paul york and liverpool have protests and leeds has got a climate jobs fair i'll be in liverpool if anyone wants to join me and then there's social media actions if you are not um, able to get anywhere in person i'll share the social media pack too um yeah and there's kind of cut carbon not forests extracts and biofuel watch with the main organizations campaigning on this at the minute but we're really open to collaborating and working with other groups i hope that was it within my time brilliant katie thanks so much so um i think now we can have a little more questions and discussion from other people in the meeting and john has had his hand up since <laughs> about half an hour so go john yeah yeah thanks for that uh, brilliant presentation um i just uh, i just want to uh, underline some points uh, people made and, and just and make some clarification myself uh, she means and what we mean by it is completely different from what the government and people like steve baker mean by it and i think we also need to be clear things about um for instance the you know what's going on with russia and and and, and the, the fact that you know russia supplies um a huge amount of gas to europe only supplies a small amount of gas to the UK. About 3% of UK gas is sourced from the Russian uh, gas fields. Yet the UK is suffering the same enormous price hike uh, for gas uh, that everyone else is because of the crazy energy market and how it works. And, and I think one point I would make is that the, um, the so-called you know, energy boycott uh, of, of, of Russian gas is actually not helping the, the transition away from uh, from fossil fuels and towards renewables. I mean, in Europe, what's happening is that um, they're classifying gas and nuclear as renewable energy, and all the money that should be going into renewable energy will be going into building new LNG storage facilities for to import more fracked gas from the US. That's a real danger, and I see similar things happening here um, with the nuclear finance bill. I think, you know, Energy bills are like a sort of poll tax on the poor because um, the poor and the rich pay, you know, a, a roughly the same amount. Uh, their bills are roughly the same amount, whereas the incomes of the rich and poor differ vastly. The, the, the amount they pay is roughly the same, and per unit, as uh, uh, is 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 as um, Ruth raised, is is actually higher for poor people. And the nuclear financing bill, which the government has passed, is going to be a poll tax on the poor because it, the, the cost of nuclear is going to be shouldered on, on the uh, bill payers. And so what I think we need to do, I think we all need to come together. And I would propose that we organise an energy justice block for the TUC demonstration on the 18th of June, and we all come together as an energy justice block and put forward, you know, the demands for, you know, public ownership of energy, for mass insulation, for, um, you know, fair tariffs that don't penalise the poor. You know, all these things we could put together, put together in a, in a, in a manifesto or a, a number of demands and then and, and actually use it to build for the 18th of, 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 of June. Uh, and I would also support the stop the war uh, demonstration as well which i think is a uh, sometime next week in may i think you know we are strongest as a movement when we come together i remember when we were at cop 26 we was, we was, we were, were very strong and i think we need to come back together to to stop uh, i think the government's plans i think they are quite I think they do want to overturn the fracking ban. I, I think we can stop them from doing it if we uh, all mobilize now and not be, um, you know, complacent about what they have, because I think, you know, they can use these reports from the British Geological Survey to say it's safe. So um, I think we should take the very serious 
obviously uh, the news, the opportunities we have to actually, uh, you know, build that, that mass movement that can actually change things. I'll leave it at that. John, Clara? Oh, yes. Thanks, Claire. Hopefully you can hear me. My connection is not very good, so I'm leaving my video off. But um, yeah, thank you for the organizer of the event and the, the contributions. Really interesting. I think in particular, it's really important that we hear about like individual projects like, uh, you know, the oil fields or the drugs power plants. Uh, very important. We link up the bigger picture with also individual projects and infrastructures. Uh, but really, uh, my, for me, it's, it's more of a question about finances. I was just wondering if uh, Gabrielle, Tina and Katie may have some suggestion about how their campaigns look at the, the financing of those projects. Um, obviously, we would have some public subsidies or public intervention and funding, uh, but also there are like the, the private funding. And I'm wondering if as part of the campaign, they've tackled those issues of fossil finance and you know what, what sort of type of action they did or have they got any uh, reflection on that? Thanks. Thanks, Clara. Um, has anyone else um, given them their hand up? And so I wondered if um, any of the speakers want to come back on that question of uh, Financing. I know it's a huge um, thing globally, the financing and insuring of fossil fuels from here in the UK, particularly in London. I'm happy to come in to talk a bit about the finances that we were dealing with. Also, just a quick question for John Zilla. You, you said that, you know, the government could still come back with a geological report to say that you know, fracking is safe. Well, I think that's nigh on impossible. Like I said, absolutely nothing has changed. They cannot control an earth tremor. They discovered that, that they put this traffic light system in, but the biggest earth tremor we had at 2.9 happened in sort of a day and a half, two days after they stopped activity. So you cannot control what happens once you set off a seismic action. And there's no way our geology can cope with that. I, I do have a lot of faith in the in unsuitability of fracking on our geology. It's been proved to fail at every single attempt they've done. And they've done 10 years of trying and got nowhere, not a squeak of gas. <coughs> Even when they did finally reach it, they had to bring in additional butane to ignite the flares because there wasn't enough gas to even ignite the flare off. It was ludicrous. With regard to what Clara, Clara said with finances, yeah, we spent a lot of time looking at who was investing in this and where was the money coming from. So aside from the individual investors who it's well worth finding out where are they talking, where can you watch the share price? So for us, we went over to a site called Hot Copper. Don't do that as a search term, by the way, that's really bad. Anyway, Hot Copper um, is a big Australian um, uh, site for shareholders of companies all across the world, particularly oil and gas. And there they have a forum and it's open, you can read it. Um, and we impacted them by, we'd watch what the investors were saying and saying, oh my God, it's finally happening. They're gonna get the drill in the ground this week. And we take photos and send them in and go, you know what, you're being lied to. They're not even that far ahead yet. And then when we had little successes, like getting companies to pull out, we put that in there. The share price went from, you know, a dollar 70 or whatever it was at the beginning to three cents at the end. And we watched that collapse because that mattered with regard to insurers. Absolutely. Because for a lot of these people who provide financial support to bad industries, well, that bad industry is only one item on their portfolio. And if you threaten to keep on bad mouthing them and blockading them or ensuring that people you know that you're writing to people who are using that insurer and saying, do you realize what else they do and getting your counselors and your MPs involved, that they're supporting an industry that's causing harm, then I think that that company looks at the insurer, for instance, can look at its whole portfolio and go, well, this one thing's likely to put our reputation at risk. It's going to cause us inconvenience people will turn up people will campaign and we have to make sure there is 
that side of campaigning. All the background stuff's really important, but there still needs to be a presence at places like this to say, this is the bad guy and we really must stop them. And then that way, all of the background work that's being done with letter writing and so on and petitions and objecting to planning and so on can actually kick in and matter. Um, investors too, when you look at something like, say with fracking, they had Quadrilla got Centrica involved and Centrica promised to sign up and give them all this money. And it was done in three stages. But again, each stage, they failed to meet the requirement of production that would allow that money to come to them. And in the end, Centrica backed out. So, you know, we can see that there's a lot of like because this is i mean something like fracking is a policy scheme and has been in the states it's not made money for the frackers you know and then in the end they're abandoned wells and no one can afford to monitor them or check up on the safety in years to come because you know once they've fracked underground they've left behind a great deal of infrastructure underground and in 2015 the infrastructure bill came was made law and meant that they can leave anything they want down there so it used to be that they would have to monitor you know, liquid waste from the energy sector would have to be monitored by EU law for 20 years over a 30 mile radius. <coughs> but then the infrastructure bill changed that. And so now they don't have to monitor it. And that's really deadly and dangerous. But again, a really key messaging point to give to residents who are going to live above and near those areas to know that, you know, they may close down. It's like they're about to, well, they were supposed to um, abandon the well here and, and close it up. But, you know, in a year's time, two years time, 20 years time, you know, when that infrastructure that's still underground, the pipe work begins to perish, what happens then? What happens to all of that, you know, chemical concentration and, you know, built up radioactivity down there? Where does that go and how does that pass? And does it come through the aquifer once that, you know, infrastructure begins to perish? So, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if that answered either of the questions as well as I'd have liked to, but yeah, those are my thoughts on it. But finance, absolutely vital because, that's where they don't want to bleed. They don't want to bleed with finance or with reputation. So hit everyone who's working with them. Thanks, Dean. I think um, Gabriel and Katie might have some things to say about finance as well, but I did just want to bring in Ruth, who's got her hand up. Yeah, on finances, uh, I don't know about the financing of the companies, but I think one of the things that's really crucial for us to be, any of us, to be bringing out all the time now is the finances of that goes on our bills. And uh, we were preparing for when the government brought out their energy and security policy. Um, uh, we were preparing to try to have a simple uh, like a list that would lay out what the cost of energy is that comes from wind, what's the cost of energy coming from solar, what's the cost of energy from nuclear, gas, and so on. And I have to say it was hard to get. Uh, and, you know, we went to Friends of the Earth, we went to the Green Party, we went, went to yeah, E3G, we went all over the place. And the, the best was uh, Simon Evans, I think it is, uh, from Carbon Brief, uh, who did come up with some comparative statistics. But I think that is our really strong point now. And I think people who are desperate to know, you know, whether they're going to be able to survive, uh, will listen when you say, this is cheaper, this is how much cheaper this is than that, nuclear and all of it. Uh, and uh, it, we, are, we are not the kind of experts who can do that research. But I'm sure there are people here who either can or know somebody who can. And I think it would be invaluable to get that and, and you know, share it among us all um, and, you know, bring in the points about how the, uh, the gas uh, exploration and fracking will not bring down prices uh, for uh, the people in the UK. Um, I hope you will also, uh, at least some of you, look at energy for all. And I've kind of been listening out for people's responses to that, because of course we care about it. Uh, and people were saying, oh, fairer pricing and so on. But nobody actually picked up on this proposal of a free band of energy. Um, and uh, I 
and know that you can't necessarily say anything about it quickly because it needs thinking about. And there is a lot of detail and stuff that needs to be worked out. And we can't work it out. That has to be worked out, you know, as XR say, uh, you know, by a wide conversation among the whole population. But we know that it's a better, better system than the upside down pricing system that we have now, where you pay more if you use less. Uh, and uh, I hope you will look at it and I hope you will support it and sign on to it on the website uh, and you know contribute to that conversation because frankly none of the other things that are being said about fuel poverty you know yes extend the warm home discount yes you know give 200 pounds here and take it back with the other hand yes you know the rest of it the idea of a, a calling idea of, of uh, doing it by a um, uh, taking fat off uh, energy. Uh, you know, a lot of things that are just not not thought out are regressive socially in terms of social justice uh, and are bad for the climate in terms of encouraging uh, more carbon emissions. You know, a lot of those solutions, we haven't seen another one that works. That's why we've had to come out with this one, even though we hadn't been able to find anybody to crunch numbers for, for us and say oh, it would look like this, it would look like that. We hadn't been able to do that. But we came out with it because none of the other stuff that's, that's being put forward touches the depths of fuel poverty that are being imposed on people now. And if you all are serious about looking at that as well as climate change, I hope you'll look at this. Thank you, Ruth. And um, yeah, the, the, um, your, you put the links um, earlier on in the chat, but the chat's grown quite vast now. You might want <laughs> to stick them in again down <laughs> the bottom. <laughs> okay, so you all don't wade back. Um, so is that, so I think that's sort of the, naturally the end of the meeting is when you, we bring speakers back to say like final words and and Ruth, you've really, you've really done that. And I can't see anyone else who wants to uh, make a contribution. Stick your hand up now. I think Gabriel was going to put in something yeah. on finance on to the last question that I rather monopolised. Sorry. No, it was fine. Well, I was thinking maybe um, roll, roll that into the, the final <laughs> roundup, if you see what I mean. Um, because um, maybe you would want to just have enough time at the end for everyone to everyone to have their say and um but there's just so there are so many different things to talk about but some really good points made by everyone um Suzanne would you like to come and say what you know what's inspired you by in all this discussion um just having uh, so as Tina said so many people here um who are um, you know, friends and allies uh, uh, and comrades and activists that work together in, um, in many different campaigns over the year it is in itself inspirational, but we do have a particular moment confronting us and how we respond to that moment is absolutely crucial. Ruth's last point in terms of fuel poverty. Um, and I do hope people will look at the uh, Ruth's um, and fuel poverty's proposals. We will do that definitely in terms of campaign against climate change more formally. Um, but there's another round of price increases coming people's way in October. And already the stories that you hear of the choices that people are having to make. I was on a call um, in Edinburgh organised by um, uh, the, 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 the kind of post COP26 coalition that's formed in Edinburgh. And in that meeting, um, uh, uh, one of the speakers um, who's coming from a, a campaigning perspective in terms of poverty um, is already coming across stories of people who are burning things in their home in order to keep warm because they cannot afford the bills. And again, the most vulnerable, as Ruth made the point, you know, those on prepayment meters, um, you know, both are being charged the most, and you're on a prepayment meter out of poverty, um, are being charged the most obscene prices in comparison to others. And also the point that was made is cannot, you know, in a direct debit, we, I, I, my, my, my uh, bills are on direct debit. I can spread the cost. Um, so when it comes to winter, my bills are not going to go shooting up like that. On a prepayment meter, you can't spread the cost. So as soon as it gets cold and you need to use your energy more, up go the, 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 the actual 
physical costs that you're paying there and then. It's absolutely obscene and more of it is coming this way. I, I wanted to make these final points. Um, government bashing and uh, versus solutions. We've had the solutions. We've had the solutions for decades. They just haven't been implemented. And they haven't been implemented by those in power because they've pursued alternative strategies that have maintained uh, big gold, sorry, big oil and gas in particular, and maintain, maintained an energy market that's benefited the, the, the very richest. Um, we have to criticize strategies from the government who have our money and have power to make impact on the situation if they are doing the wrong thing. And as Antonio um, Guterres said from the United Nations after the last IPCC report, um, he talked about an atlas of human misery if we don't tackle the climate crisis. If we don't tackle the, the fuel poverty crisis. We also have an atlas of human, human misery. And these are his comments in what we need to do. He said, the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing fossil fuels, investing in new fossil fuels, investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. It's a moral and economic madness. And an abdication of leadership is criminal at this moment in time. And it's criminal in terms of the climate crisis and it's brutal and it's criminal in terms of fuel poverty uh, uh, as well. We have to build a movement. We will have to fight on lots of different fronts. We will have to fight against the new uh, coal and gas exploration, um, uh, not exploration, sorry, um, extraction um, that is being taken. I, I agree with, with Tina in terms of the problems of fracking, um, but you know, crazy projects that are failed and loads of money being thrown at them has not stopped this government or other governments going down that going down that road what stopped them is the actions that ordinary people took to make it impossible for them to follow those crazy projects and the same thing applies now in that sense nothing has changed tina i absolutely agree with you except opportunism from them and hopefully nothing's changed from us from the resilience of us to fight we will have to fight on a number of different fronts and we do need a diversity of tactics i don't think we should you know it's about counterposing direct action with um you know, mass demonstrations or those kind of things, they all sit. But what I do think we need to do is build a mass movement. And that's about a movement that's got deep social roots and around uh, around which there's a, there's a kind of deep societal um, uh, co uh, coalescing uh, around what, what the way we shouldn't go versus the way that we should go. And that's really important. Hugh mentioned demands. Um, it seems to me that the demands from you know are, are there that people have raised from this meeting. It is about a mass in, in, um, uh, retrofit and insulation program, which reduce energy bills immediately and permanently. It is about uh, investment in uh, um, uh, renewable energy. It is about really fundamentally tackling fuel poverty in the way that Ruth talked about about actually changing the system, changing the energy system, and changing the way that it works. Um, um, uh, uh, for, 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 for ordinary uh, for ordinary people. I think that John's proposal of an energy uh, uh, an energy justice block on the, the TUC demonstration um, of the 18th um, is an excellent solution. It's not solution, sorry, excellent proposal. There is going to be a climate block on that demonstration, so we do need to start mobilizing around that. But I also think we, 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 we need to uh, pick it up in our local areas as well. I know there have been some cost of living demonstrations in, in, in local areas, but I think we need to revisit this. May the 1st is, is coming up, there will be those kind of, I think we need to revisit in our local areas. And uh, people, um, you know, as well as those, 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 those demonstrations, there's a range of other things that we need to, to, to be doing as well as raise, raising the demands. We need to be uh, actually active in our, our communities, we need to stop that, uh, the impact on, the, on those people who are suffering the most uh, impact in terms of, uh, of, their, of, their, um, of their bills. It's time for me to stop. Um, tonight, uh, we'll have, we have you know, a similar kind of thing happening in lots of other places. We need to keep coming together and we need to pull together a movement um, that has got um, real yeah, momentum behind it on a number of different fronts and uh, coherently nationally as, as well. Thanks, Suzanne. And, um... Final thoughts from Gabriel? Um, 
it's uh hard hard act to to follow but i mean i just want to say like i really yeah really um appreciate being here on this call being invited in everyone's time and i think just wanted to echo kind of the diversity of tactics and strategy and thinking about sorry i think this uh, dog in the corner who lives with me is going to bark soon um just yeah i just wanted to um you know i think that like what we're really focusing on is how we can we are looking at you know ending ending the bad stopping the bad in a way that's like kind of directly supporting what we want to have happen and so i just wanted to commit to kind of like you know looking and taking back the energy for all proposal and like talking it with the coalition members and kind of getting their thoughts and really just having like you know if anyone wants to reach out and work with us um and think about how we can bring in some of these struggles that are being faced across the world from these same companies and i think to answer the finance question you know i think what we're really trying to do with the campaign is put political pressure on MPs and make this a decision that's on their doorstep and challenge them and use that to kind of shame and hopefully mobilize some of them to act. And then building those bridges to these same companies that are doing these kind of projects in, in countries across the world and how can we sort of coordinate across um, across geographies. Um, but also just wanted to leave with a bit of um, maybe like a, a bit more of a hopeful tone because we're very much uh, about this, you know, it's in the name, stop Canva, stop Jackdaw. Um, but I think what we did last year really much, very much like following in the footsteps and with some of the folks that, you know, I think were really inspired by the anti-fracking work um, was really kind of shook the industry. And I don't think they expected that amount of resistance and that amount of really challenge. And, you know, if you look at what Shell did the way Nicholas Sturgeon came out against new oil and gas. If you look at Shell's annual accounts, they kind of talk about this risk of delays and litigation from activism and people speaking out as a material risk to their um, their efforts. And so I think that was just um, a huge boost for us. And I think I'm really hopeful in, in terms of what we can all, you know, pursuing different tactics or the same goal can do together. Um, so just, yeah, I want to offer that. And if anyone wants to reach out about ways that we can work together, really, uh, welcome that and thanks for having me in the space. Thanks. It's all about um, making the links. You've got a dog. I've got a cat here. Um, <laughs> so Katie, thanks. Yeah, th thanks a lot for having me. Um, and I think probably the, the overarching thing from our point of view is to be wary of false solutions when we're fighting for change um, biomass being just one of them hydrogen's been mentioned and to really apply scrutiny you know we had um, a meeting with Steve Rotherham our um you know our metro mayor and we were trying to explain the issues with hydrogen and he was just like look we don't have time to get it absolutely right we've just got to do something and I think the yeah, could just caution in against we've got to do something leading to bad solutions where in the case of, you know, biomass, we've got that we're subsidising out of like our bills, the chopping down of trees, which is, you know, well, I've discussed it in the presentation. Um, and at a time when we're facing a climate and emergency cri uh, climate crisis and, you know, a, a fuel sort of security energy crisis, sorry. The fact that, you know, we're kind of, it's coming out of our energy bills to pay for this false solution, you know, is particularly galling. Um, so that that's kind of my final words. Um, any, if you want any info on, on biofuel stuff or anything um, that I've discussed, just get in touch. And please, 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 wherever you are, take part in our AGM actions tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Katie. And, um... As Wolfgang had to go, um, the last one is Tina to come back and speak. Okay, so I, I get from the, some of the uh, messages at the side that there was an air of thinking there was maybe some complacency with the fracking. There isn't complacency, but there's an acceptance that nothing has changed. We won on the basis of the facts and the geology. So we're pretty certain that that's unchangeable no matter what happens in Russia or Ukraine. So even though the government is saying things, it's only 26 Tory MPs, it's only the climate deniers. Kwasi Kwarteng came out and said um, that they're still pretty much where they were and they weren't looking to proceed. But no, we don't take your eye off the ball, you never can. But I also know that people who fought for more than a decade are no way not coming back out 
should this start? You know, there's no way you do that, what you've done, and go, oh, well, this time we'll let them, because we absolutely won't. The same with the LNG terminals, if they start trying to bring it in from the States, partly because what this network is in this group, we have with people who are fighting fracking in Australia and America and Canada and Argentina and um, you know, Namibia and places like that. So there is that unity that, you know, should, I mean, we were asked by the states, please don't let it be developed. Please don't have your LNG sites and take in those dragon ships that they're called. Um, so I don't doubt that we would hopefully try to rally at those sites and, and ensure that that's highlighted that what fracking's not good enough for UK, it's too dangerous, but we're quite happy to see our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. You know, like here, for instance, our local MP, who's a Tory, um, finally said no to fracking in this area, but he's the Argentinian trade envoy who's actually pushing it and financing it in Argentina. So, you know, it's a hard win because, you you know, but it's like whack-a-mole for all of us, isn't it? You know, you knock one thing down and the little ugly beast pops out the next hole. And like I said earlier, we don't have the tools in our democracy that we should have of universities and media and all those things that should be telling the truth. That's all been taken. All we've got is little buckets. But, you know, we wield them well. And I, I have so much faith in activists and unions and campaign groups and you know the way that we do pull together and no one gives up that yeah it could come back but no i don't think the savagery of our anti-fracking movement would allow that without you know putting our hobnail boots on and doing something more but you know they are still doing other industries that are very similar to fracking um or at least issuing licenses but there is no production yet so again it's still all to play for, but I think that the for us the ball is in our court in that nothing has changed that they can convince us of. So, but yeah, anyway, but yeah, so great to be in the room. Thank you very much, and I take it I'm the last one. So apart from from Claire, um, thank you to Claire and Suzanne for pulling us together and for the really insightful questions and delivery from all the other speakers. And thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, and finishing on notes of uh, reminding us the need for international solidarity, not just thinking about what's in this country, um, but having faith in our movement and um, the, I think, quite accurate description of campaigning as playing whack-a-mole. So thank you everybody so much um, for coming today. And um, I can uh, send around some of the links that were shared to people who are here. And um, I'll see you all at another meeting soon, I hope, or out on the streets.